reflection moment, you can't afford to let them win. Have you ever heard of the notion of being a bigger person? So let me tell you, sometimes being the bigger person is the only option you have. So think about it. I know they offended you. I know they talked to you crazy. I know they handled you wrong. But sometimes you cannot afford to return that type of energy. Be the bigger person. And as annoying as it sounds sometimes, because that girl I know, listen, girl, I know. I'm here with you. I know you want to tell them up. I know you want to cuss them out. I know you want to prove a point. But sometimes the only point that you need to prove is that you're bigger than that person. That that shade, that negativity, the pettiness is truly beneath you. Can you afford to really, really, really give it back to them? Your blessing is bigger. You're moving forward. Your prize is bigger. Your prize is higher. So continue to have that high frequency and let them be low vibrational. And girl, sometimes just be that bigger person. You don't have to have Adam. You don't have to prove a point. Don't do it, girl. The only point that you need to prove is that you're a winner and that your blessing is so big. It's tailor-made just for you. And you can't afford to stoop to that level. You can't afford to lose that blessing that's waiting for you, that's tailor-made just for you. So don't do it today, girl. I know you want to do it. And I know they treated you wrong. Believe me, I know it. Like I said, I'm here with you. I know they were wrong. And I know you were in the right. But you don't have to prove nothing. You don't owe anybody anything. So today, a lesson I want to give you, sometimes being a bigger person is the only option. Because your blessing is too big. It's tailor made just for you. And there's no one, or no person, place, or thing. There's no one that has gotten under your skin that's worth losing that blessing just to prove a point to them. Hey, queen. Welcome to today's episode of the Q Chat. Today, our special guest is Miss Lachi. She is USA Today's 2024 Woman of the Year a Grammys board governor, and the founder of Ramp.org, a global network that champions music creators and professionals with disabilities. As a visually impaired individual, Lachi has made significant strides in bringing accessibility to the forefront, including walking a red carpet at the Grammys with her signature glam mobility cane. Her advocacy work and inspiring story have been featured in major publications like the New York Times, Billboard, and Vogue. Today, we'll dive into her incredible journey, her advocacy work, and her vision for the future. She's a queen about a business, working hard on a mission, and her purpose-driven crown on never tilted. Go queen, Go queen. Go queen. So thank you guys for joining another episode of the Key Chat. Today, my very special guest is Miss Lachi, and she is a, the USA Today's two, 2024 Woman of the Year. So I'm so excited to speak with her. She's a singer, songwriter, and she's a disability activist. We're going to dive into her passion and her mission and what drives her and also the awareness that she's bringing to our community. So how are you doing today? I am doing so well. Thank you so much for having me. I am honored to be here. Awesome. I'm so happy and blessed to have the opportunity to speak with you. So I wanted to start off with your personal journey. You know, as I said in your intro, you've achieved a lot. So I definitely would like you to just give us your background and just Tell us about everything and how you got started with your advocacy and what makes you such a great, great, great warrior to just educate everyone about disability awareness. Yes. So I am based in New York. I love to tell people I'm an Aries, so I am not shy and I am not yeah. quiet about anything I'm doing. I'm um, your Aries sister. <laughs> ah, yes. Let's yes. go. Awesome. <laughs> Um, but you know what? Listen, I am a recording artist. I am a songwriter. I have had the pleasure of being able to tour the world for my art and work with really amazing household names. And 
I speak publicly very often on identity pride, disability culture identity, women's pride, black pride, intersectional pride, um, queer pride, and speaking on how all of these intertwine to really make our global culture a beautiful, colorful, and spicy culture. But I wasn't always able to really get out here and talk about those things. I mean, when I was growing up, I was a very shy and quiet kid. So born legally blind, I wasn't sort of shoved into the blind situation because I wasn't totally blind, but I couldn't really see that well. So I didn't fit in any boxes. And because of that, I was a bit of an outcast. However, also because of that, I spent a lot of time with my piano, my keyboard, my pen, writing poetry, songs, and writing little short stories and stuff where I could express myself and really understand the world around me and make it so that perhaps maybe someday the world could understand me. So music has always been a really huge part of my journey, the way that I connect with my own self and my own issues and then get that out to the world. So I am so grateful that I've been able to use my music to be able to do that. And today, apart from all of the things that I do on a personal level, just in my career, I'm also the CEO and founder of an organization called Ramped, mm -hmm. Recording Artists and Music Professionals with Disabilities. And it's really the culmination of my love for music and my recognition that music is what drives culture and my acceptance and my celebration of disability, the deepest part of myself that society has told me to hide. And through Ramped, we're a platform that connects the music and entertainment industry to disability inclusive tools, to people getting folks opportunities in the music space that have neurodivergence and disability. So I'm just so excited, ecstatic, and energized to be able to wake up every morning and like live life with purpose, do what I love in a way that I love with people that I love. And I mean, can I really ask for more? Wow. So I definitely do want to talk some more about rap, but I wanted to ask you, what was your first introduction to music as a child? And what was that feeling? Because I know music is such a love affair. And just to be able to be a music artist and to play instruments, it's a beauty involved in that. So what was your first introduction to music? You know, my mom, bless her heart, because I don't know if this is true or not, but she said while other babies would kick in the womb, I would play the piano against her tummy, which I don't see the proof. I don't know how she would have got a piano in there. But look, Amazon will deliver anywhere. So I was like, but from a very super duper young age, I was very much into music. And I had an older sister who was into music and dance and um, they thought she was going to be the big musician. And then she didn't want her keyboard. She was about to throw it out because she was like, I can't figure it out. But for me, I saw her keyboard just on the wayside when I was about like probably four or five years old. And I just started tinkering on it. And I taught myself a chord, which is like three notes together that sound very beautiful. And at you know three, four years old, I'm like, oh, this is really nice. I want more of this kind of like feeling against my soul. <laughs> and so very early, I started playing the piano, tinkering around, writing songs, making all my stuffed animals be a choir. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And uh, my mom figured out, like, listen, she obviously has a love for music, um, but also it was just a place for me to, to talk about the things that I couldn't talk about, even in elementary school and in middle school when I didn't have a lot of friends. So I always had that piano and the keyboard to turn to um, pretty much at all times as my, as the thing that held me. Mm, awesome. That's beautiful. So Thank beautiful. You. I wanted to also ask you about Ramped, of course. Yeah. And I know you gave us some, uh, some nuggets, obviously, about Ramped and the beautiful impact of it. But I wanted to get a little deeper in what was the origins of what like made you decide one day, hey, I want to start this organization. And I also want to ask you, what has been the impact of Ramped within the music industry? Yes. So, you know, when I, so I'm legally blind, right? I use a cane. But when I was really young and I was first told that I needed to use a cane and I granted, I had much better vision when I was younger. So my vision that I have is degenerative. Right. So when I was younger, I had much better vision, but it still wasn't that great. 
So they said, you need to use a cane. And I was like, I am already outcast. I'm absolutely not using a cane. Are you kidding me? Right. And so the problem with that was that I actually needed a cane. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was actually should have been using it, but because of societal stigmas and already being a black woman and I was a daughter, am a daughter of Nigerian immigrants. I just felt I had so many things stacked against. So I didn't want to add that to it. Um, so then when I was, you know, came out of school, um, I ended up getting, my parents really wanted me to work at a, a job, like a day job, a desk job. They weren't, they didn't really exactly want me to do music because listen, they had, you know, a black woman with a disability trying to make it in America. They're like, girl, get you a desk job. Just get, you know, be good. Um, however, I got that desk job and I was like, this is not me. Right. I don't fit here. I actually worked for the U S army Corps of engineers. <laughs> that was my day job, but it was like, I can't, I didn't know what misogynoir was. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have words like that. I didn't have words like ableism and stuff like that. So I didn't know what was happening to me at work that I just could not stand, but I could not stand it. And I didn't have the expression for it. And the only way that I could, you know, figure out what was going on was through music. So eventually I ended up leaving that day job. I got signed by a major label. Um, at that time, they were called EMI. And, you know, while I was with them, they wanted to market me as like a blind shtick, right? And I just wasn't feeling it. Um, I had just got out of my day job. I was just trying to get on the scene and I felt like I was being pigeonholed as a blind person. Now, anyone who knows me will be like, but Lachi, you talk about blindness all the time today. So then what are you talking about? Well, it wasn't from a place of strength. I think they were just trying to use it as a marketing tool and I just didn't like it. So I ended up leaving that deal and working independently. Um, and as I worked independently and you know, had to build my own self back up. I started getting in really good rooms. I got a really great manager who knew a bunch of people and he was getting me in great recording rooms with great artists and stuff like that. Now, here's the reason I said all of this is because what I always wanted in life was to get in these big rooms, right? These rooms with real people, these, you know, major label rooms with major label artists. And I wasn't able to do my best. Why not? Cause I couldn't see. <laughs> so I was having trouble seeing, I was tripping on stuff. I was missing handshakes, but I wasn't going to use the cane and I wasn't going to tell anybody. Do you get what I'm saying? And so, but the, I'm shooting myself in the foot because if they knew, then they would provide me with the stuff I need to do my best and deserve to be there. So what I finally, I had it like, I had it up to here. I was like, I'm gonna have to just come out about my disability because my blindness is starting to get to a point. It was much worse than it was when I had first started. Mm -hmm. And so I did. Um, I came out at a Grammy party that they were having in New York. I showed up with my cane. Um, and when I walked into the room, people were like, oh, what's that? I'm like, oh, well, this is a cane. I use it because I can't really see that well. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I knew something was up. You know, like it wasn't even that serious mm -hmm. because I had already really established myself musically. So when I walked into that room, they were like, oh, for real? You know, oh, where? <laughs> so, um, however, when I came out, I realized nobody else was like me out here. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they were, but they were also hiding it like I had been. And I started asking different places like, oh, what are y'all doing about accessibility? Um, do you have any programming for people with different disabilities? Even if it's just, even if it's, you know, mental health disabilities. Um, and they were like, yeah, nah, man, we ain't got nothing set up. What you want? So <laughs> I was like, they they had said there's nobody with disabilities. Yeah. And I was like, yes, there is. I am. And I was acting like there wasn't. So there's got to be way more people like me that are hiding it, but just ain't got no support. So I decided on my own to run around and just find all of them. <laughs> And so I started looking one by one, this COVID had hit, you know, George Floyd, right? So DEI was everywhere. Um, nobody was talking about accessibility and except for me. Mm -hmm. So people started asking me to come do talks and discussions. And eventually the recording Academy asked me to do one, the Grammys. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, uh, okay. So it was me, 
um, a couple of artists that I have found that had disabilities that were like doing pretty decent and the recording academy leadership, like Valicia Butterfield Jones and all them. And so we had this discussion and we talked about some of the issues about like disclosure, about inaccessible venues, about stigmas, all of that stuff. And at the end, she was like, you know, this is all great. We're taking notes and we're going to come back to y'all with what the Recording Academy wants to try to do to, you know, about this topic. Um, and I remember thinking to myself at the end of this panel, and it was a public panel. It blew up and went kind of viral. I remember thinking at the end, like, who are you going to come back to? Us? We're just some kids that do music. Like, we're, we're, we can't hold the Recording Academy accountable. Mm. Um, after that, people started coming into my DMs. They started coming into my emails. And they were like, bro, we want to be a part of your organization. Um, we want to be a part of your movement. We want to do this. We want to do that. And I was like, uh, what organization? <laughs> like, what movement? Um, I did not want to. Everybody's like, Lachi, you need to start this. You obviously already started something. So you need to do it, make it. Um, but I was having trouble in my own career, right? I was just going from step you know, one to step two. I was trying to really do my own thing and double down and make sure that I can establish myself. I can't be starting an organization right now. Um, my manager for four years, the one that put me on, um, had passed away to COVID um, right around that time. Um, and so it was just so much. But one day I went to sleep, woke up, and I had the acronym RAMPED, Recording Artists and Music Professionals with Disabilities, R-A-M-P-D. And I was like, if that's God not telling me I got to do this, then. <laughs> so I did it. Um, I doubled down. I got everybody together. I put together like a... Um, you know, when you register a business and all of that. And I got some people together. I was like, I'm going to found this. Do y'all want to be founding members? Um, it was some people from the panel. They said, yes. Um, we started having like these internal like discussions on Zoom. Tell us, you know, what is our platform? What are we going to do? It was all very freedom fighter. It was all very like justice meets music, meets culture, meets disability. And we were just getting real rowdy in there. And people started hearing about us. The Grammy started seeing what we were doing. Um, National Independent Venue Association, which is like the independent version of Live Nation, um, started hearing what we were doing. People started going like, hey, we want to be a part of whatever y'all are putting together. Um, because we were established artists. We were established music professionals that worked for like labels and stuff that had never had community before when it comes to disability and neurodivergence. Um, then we started getting money. So we started getting grants. And we were like, yo, we don't even have an infrastructure to like, we don't have a bank account. How are we <laughs> receiving this money? So we started getting money. We started getting all sorts of um, press asking us questions. Finally, the Grammys came to us and was like, will y'all help make the Grammys accessible, more mm -hmm. accessible in 2022? And we were just like, yes, even though we had no idea what that even meant. So we were just like, yep, we're going to do it. So we started meeting. We started meeting with the Grammys. And we, you know, we're talking about like, let's get ASL up there. Let's get an accessible stage. Let's do this. Let's do that. And they were just kind of like, yes. And, you know, let's try it. The Grammys rolls around. Um, all of a sudden, the New York Times comes up to us and they're like, we heard that y'all are helping do accessibility for the Grammys. And I was like, the New York Times? Boy, I read you. <laughs> So they came and it was really amazing. They did this big, beautiful story on us. It blew up. Um, we did the Grammys. That blew up. Um, Billboard came and spoke to us. Um, who else came? Hollywood Reporter came and spoke to us. And it was over. Um, we had a website. The people started really flooding that website, trying to be members, trying to do partnerships, trying to figure out where they can have donations. And it has really taken off. And the funny thing about that origin story is that the momentum, like that kind of like vigor and passion and like, yo, let's just go do this. Let's just build the ship as it's happening is still going on today. Um, we have been working with the Grammys for three years now. We have done stuff with Netflix music. We have done programming with Sony Pictures Television. We have done collaborations with Tidal. We have done collaborations with women in music, with different mayor's offices. And now what we do is we also offer like paid opportunities, paid visibility, community connectivity um, to our members who identify as having a disability or neurodivergence within the music industry. And even right now we have 
inked a um, a nice, beautiful collaboration with Live Nation. We're going to be having a party with them on July 26th to start talking about what we're going to do together to make venues more accessible in a way that is beneficial to the venue so they're not running away thinking that it's all legalese. Um, of course, we're going to continue to work with the Recording Academy, and we're going to continue to provide um, disability inclusive tools and consultation to the music industry. So it's obviously something I'm very, very proud of, but it did start from a place of there is a problem that needs to be fixed. Oh shit, I gotta be the one to fix it. <laughs> right, right. So of course, as I mentioned, you were named USA Today's 2024 Woman of the Year. So I want to ask you, how does it feel to have that recognition and what is this doing, you know, for your career and with your platform? What has this done for you? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the beauty of it is it is always an amazing feat for a Black woman to be recognized, right? Mm -hmm. It is not the easiest thing in the world. So many people want us to um, be humble. Somebody, some of us, so many people want us to kind of be the one that's always doing all of the work, but not necessarily getting any of the glory. So as a person that is consistently in the trenches, whether it's creating, whether it is founding an organization, um, it is very nice and very beautiful, very humbling. And, you know, very, I feel very privileged uh, to be recognized um, for the work that we're doing. So that's number one. But I do want to add that third layer of disability. I'm not like um, trying to hide it. I'm very open about my disability. So to have somebody who's very open, a black woman who's open about her disability uh, to be considered um, a woman of the year, um, that's a very beautiful thing because there's a lot of women, <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of women in the world. Um, there's a lot of women in this country. There's a lot of women in New York state. So to be considered as a woman of the year for this large, beautiful, one of the most populous states in this nation, I mean, it's been great. And it's been good for my career. I got to say, a lot of people have been speaking to us. Um, I've been able to get this message out even further. And a lot of times when people think, you know, disability or accessibility, you know, it's a very white movement, just like many of these movements. And so to be the face of it and have that face be a black woman out here in the trenches, I mean, it's not lost on me. And so I'm very humbled. That's beautiful. I absolutely love it. So I want to ask you too, with our platform, we do talk about self-love. And I know you mentioned just, I would say you're an example of just defying the odds and also making sure that you created your own lane. And as you've already mentioned, just women of color, we already have different obstacles, whether mm -hmm. people want to admit that or not, but we do have different obstacles, you know? So it's already one thing when you have one card that's dealt to you, but then you have the other layer of things that's dealt with you as well. But you have created your own lane and not only have you created your own lane, you created an audience for others, which is great. Like you've taken what the cards you have been dealt with, but you've also extended that baton to help others. So I wanted to ask you, I know like you, you've definitely overcome a lot and you, you have this confidence and this glow and this energy about you. So I wanted to ask you just, Self-love is the fuel to say, hey, I'm valuable, I'm worthy, I don't have this crutch, you know, I, I can overcome these different things. So I want to ask you, what's your definition of self-love and what role has it played in your life and just in your mission and your purpose? You know, I was just thinking about this the other day with my coach. When I was young, um, I was always told to like sit down and be quiet. I was also taught, you know, being from an immigrant family may be part of it, but I was always taught like, you know, selfishness is bad, right? And so if I ever did anything that even resembled selfishness in any way, it was like, don't do that, you're being selfish. So the two things I was I always felt was celebrating myself is selfish and um, that I should only be seen and not heard, you know? And today my platform is about self-celebration. It's about identity pride. Today, my platform is about being heard, um, is about giving voice to the under-celebrated and to the voiceless or to the under-heard. And so I feel like it was that sort of pivotal change that made me go, hey, everything, all of the tr generational sort of triggers that I was given, turning those into generational treasures mm -hmm. is where the shift happened. Like even today, 
you know, I am, so I'm currently writing a book called I Identify as Blind, which should be out in 2025. And it's a celebration of identity pride. It is a celebration of, it is okay to stand in front of the part that's the part of yourself, the deepest part of yourself, society wants you to hide. When you stand in front of it, that is literally how you win at life. Um, and then finally, I'm also working on an album called Mad Different. And it's a celebration of the fact that as a black woman, people think I'm supposed to be mad. And as a person with a disability, people other me and keep me different. So you know what? I'm going to own both of them. And I'm going to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to sing about it. I'm going to celebrate about it. Because at the end of the day, we will not be able to swim to the other side of the shore if we're allowing all of the other things to drag us down and drag us back. Being um, Thinking about yourself and putting number one first is not selfish. Honestly, it is a way for you to be able to get out that barrel and drag everybody else out with you. Self-love is the only real, true, honest way that you can really love anybody else. Mm -hmm. I love what you said. Turn triggers into treasures. That is that is the line. If I, <laughs> that's the mic trap. Yes, if I have to take it exactly like interviews over. Like <laughs> you've already said enough, but that's that's amazing, and I love that. Turn your triggers into treasures because, like you said, and I know, like you just mentioned, the generational things. All of us have, and I know some people refer to things as generational curses. Regardless, we all have generational lines that sometimes like we have to overcome things that have been passed down you know i mean and like you said triggers into treasures because we can let these triggers navigate our whole life mm -hmm. and if we allow these triggers to navigate our lives it brings us to a path that is really rocky and that a path that we do not want to be on so seeing triggers into treasures is a great thing and i know that that's just something I just love it because it just it gives a person a feel like, hey, sometimes we just have some things that we have to deal with that are out of, that's out of our control. Exactly. You know, it, no matter what we we do, we can't change certain things, but we can handle how we deal with those things that yes. are out of our control. And exactly. we can say, hey, I can pivot this. And like you said, turn that trigger into treasure, turn that pain into purpose. There's a vision for all of us. And we have purpose. And that's the beautiful thing about just being self-aware and having that mindset of, hey, I can turn this pain around. I can take this disability and show you guys like, hey, I can spin this and show you how, wow, I can still accomplish great things in spite of. So I love, love, love. Oh my God. Like <laughs> I just I'm gonna I can't wait to like use this for this episode. <laughs> 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 Beautiful. You may want to think about, you know, changing some titles of some future books or something. Because I, I'm not going to say that's what yes, girl. I love it. So another thing I want to ask you. So I know you've been described as the new champion in advocacy. And of course, you've given us a lot of details and accounts of just everything that you've done to just bring some spotlight to just disabilities. And I love how you also, you didn't just leave it at physical disabilities. You also mentioned mental health, which of course is something that we are trying to build more conversations regarding because we know that mental health disability is the tricky one because that's the one that we can't see. It's not visible. So I love how you also included that as well. And with your advocacy, it's brought you in some really big places like the White House and the UN. So I wanted to ask you again to for someone that they may have, you know, a disability and sometimes it's really hard for people to accept, whether it's a physical disability or whether it's a mental health disability, sometimes it's just hard to really grasp that. You know, just like you said at one point, you didn't wanna use your cane. You know, sometimes there's so many stigmas involved and there's shame sometimes that's placed on us simply by society because we, we may be concerned with what a person will think about us and just how people will view us. And, you know, sometimes when you have a disability, you don't wanna be treated differently either so with everything that you've done like i said it's brought you to some great places what can you say to just inspire that next person who they may be still struggling and okay how can i build my confidence how can i still be able to walk into those different rooms in spite of so what would you say to encourage those individuals you know it's the thing about it is that it's 
people say stuff like, you know, you need to just get out there and love yourself and do this and do that and be proud. And it's so much easier said than done. One of the things that I love to tell people is, you know, we have this thing called the reference man, right? Which is exactly what we would all consider the average person is. But this reference average person is generally like a white, you know, middle-aged or, you know, young middle-aged healthy male. And if you, the more you deviate away from that, then maybe the less successful you appear or the less hireable you appear or the less Hollywood movies represent you, right? And so everybody says, do what you can to be as close to that reference man as possible. What I say is actually do what you can to not be as close to that reference man as possible. Do what you can to celebrate the different parts of yourself. Because you know what? All of the innovators and all of the billionaires out there, they do that. And this idea of scarcity is a social construct. There is space for you. There is space for that different you. What we don't want is two of the same thing. So celebrate that different part of you. Bring that different part of you out. Celebrate that different part. Because you know what? You don't want to be treated the same as everybody else. You actually want to be treated the way you deserve to be treated. Right? When people are like, oh, you know what? I just want, I have a disability, but I want you to just treat me like you treat everybody else. No, bitch, treat me like I deserve to be treated. <laughs> and so I tell people, celebrate that part of you because guess what? Authenticity, fortune favors the authentic. Fortune favors the bold. Fortune favors the real. And when you are able to be authentic, bold, and real with yourself, then you will start to attract the power and the beauty and the purpose that you deserve. I love it. I love it. I love it. So I wanted to ask you to, obviously we mentioned mental health. What are some practices that you do to just keep your mental health intact, you know, to stay mentally aware and have for your mental wellness? Are there some practices that you may do just, you know, to keep yourself on point? Absolutely. Um, obviously, everybody's going to tell you sleep, water, and exercise, right? Um, one of the big things that I think people talk about a lot, but you don't always see people putting it into practice, but it is really almost like a cure-all, is gratitudes. Mm -hmm. Gratitudes have been proven scientifically to actually literally work. Um, I gratitude journal. Uh, I gratitude with my partners and my friends. And let, I'll be like, yo, let's just sit down in a circle and do some gratitudes. And it actually really helps because really, honestly, life is what you make of it, right? The way you perceive life is how you're going to navigate through it. And if you perceive life as a series of bogged down hardships, then life is going to be a bogged down hardship. But if you see life Glass half full, silver lining, as a great, beautiful party that you have been invited to, you are going to make the best of your life because you got invited to this dope party that you, you specifically was supposed to be here for. And so gratitudes really help align the beauty and purpose of all of the things that have happened to you, even if they are things that are unfortunate. So I say do gratitudes, um, positive self-talk. The words we use really do matter. So I remember a lot of times when I'm doing a lot of these discussions, I tell people to, to self-describe um, for any of the blind folks in the room, right? So I'll say something like, you know, my name is Lachi. I am a black woman with cornrows and I am here to speak with you today, et cetera, et cetera. Then I'll ask somebody else to do it. And they'll say like, you know, oh, you know, I am you know, a short, not too, a very stocky, you know, very unassuming, terribly, you know, freckled, you know, just bad words. And you can mm -hmm. say the same exact thing about yourself using positive words, positive self-talk and positive words really do matter because your brain doesn't know the difference. If someone uh, on the street tells you you're not beautiful or tells you you're not smart, um, you know, that doesn't feel very good. And so it's going to be the same when you tell that stuff to yourself. Um, so definitely give yourself positive self-talk and give yourself grace. Mm, I love it. I love it. Can you give us, if you have to come up with an affirmation, I could be putting you on the spot. <laughs> give us a good affirmation. Woo! Yeah, so that is, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I've been trickling out affirmations left and right. 
you know, um, I'm somewhat wrong for asking you that because <laughs> Triggers to Treasures was actually perfect. But, you know, hey, I'm just going to toss another app, a bone to you to see if you can come up. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, the one thing that I always really love to say, and I've said it a couple times during this interview, but I believe it stands to be said again, you know, accept the deepest part of yourself that society wants you to hide, wants you to change. Uh, because that is your spark. That is the most unique you. And when you are able to celebrate the deepest part of yourself, that is how you win at life, period. I love it. So I want to ask you, what can we expect in the future for RAMP? What are some of the future goals that you have? What are some things that you would like to see with RAMP for just put, bringing more awareness and just doing more things in the industry? What are some things that you have on the books for RAMP? Honestly, with RAMP, what we really want to do is have more major partnerships with folks like Live Nation and folks like the Recording Academy to begin bringing real platform to this discussion on disability inclusion, culture, mental health discussion, real mental health discussion, not mental health as a buzzword, making mm -hmm. venues more accessible for all people, not just folks with in wheelchairs, um, but folks with arthritis. I mean, disability goes beyond um, just folks in wheelchairs that are blind or deaf. We want to work with folks that have dyslexia, ADHD, like I said, arthritis, anxiety, bipolar, all of these things fit. And so we want to start to help normalize it. I believe that how, you know, hip hop really elevated black culture and country music has really elevated rural culture. I believe that disability culture can also be elevated through music. And that is what we really um, hope and aspire to do through Ramped in a very, um, in a very major way. And that's what I just in my own personal career really hope to do which is to utilize pop culture to be able to amplify disability discussion to mainstream narrative. Um, and so that's what I'm doing through my book. That's what I'm doing through my album that I'm putting together. And that's what we're doing through Ramped. And so for anybody who's watching this, if you are in the music industry, the entertainment industry, um, live um, events industry, and you uh, have a disability, neurodivergence, um, chronic pain, chronic condition, if you're deaf, if you're a little person, like anything that makes you stand out and be completely different, please come reach out to Ramps. We are looking for you. We want to work with you. You can be anywhere in the industry, not just an artist. You can be um, somebody that works at the desk, at a table. You can be a booking agent, whatever. We want to work with you because this movement is taking off and being for real. And um, is doing what we want, which is to infiltrate pop culture. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so <laughs> much for such a wonderful conversation. Um, before we do end everything, though, please tell everyone how they can connect with you. I know you also did your call to action for rent, but tell them how they can reach out to you directly, all your social medias if you have any. Tell everybody how they can connect with you and learn more. Sure. If you want to, I'll give you my personal and I'll give you ramped. So if you want to connect with us personally, you can find us at Lachi Music, L-A-C-H-I-M-U-S-I-C. -I -I We're a fully um, disability led team. Um, you can also email us at team at lachimusic.com with any questions and any whatever you want. We're here to help. If there's any way that we can support you, you let us know. We are here for it. Um, if you want to get in contact with Ramped, you can find Ramped on socials at R A at on Instagram at R A M P D underscore U P. We are also on Facebook, YouTube, all of the thing things, right? Um, and if you want to reach out to us via email, you can hit us up at contact at ramp.org. So that's C-O-N-C-A-C-T, right? That's how you spell contact, at ramp.org, R-A-M-P-D.org. And if you want to, if you need any support from us, we are absolutely here. Even if it's just to try to talk through how to disclose, even if it's just try to meet some other people that have what you have, even if it's to try to meet other people who have what you have, um, reach out to us. We're here for you. Awesome. Thank you so much again for this amazing conversation. And again, I hope that everyone takes, if anything, takes a gem that we can turn our triggers into treasure, whatever card that's been dealt to us. It's not 
the end all be all. We can overcome anything. And I know it sounds cliche. No one wants to hear that. But we really can take the cards that were dealt to us and we can map out our own blueprint. We can create our own lane. There's nothing that has to be a crutch to us. We can take that and spin it. We really can create our own lane. And we really can turn our triggers into treasure and just be live a beautiful life. Like she said, ask for people to treat you the way you deserve to be treated. Demand that and ask for it. And when you walk in rooms, command it no matter what card that you think you have that's handicapping you. Sometimes the handicap is really in our mind and the way that we think and the way that we box ourselves in. So remember, you can turn those triggers into treasures. You can live your best life and just do whatever you can and just be treated the way you deserve. Demand it. Ask for it. Don't be treated like everybody else. Be treated the way that you deserve. So thank you guys again. And thank you, Miss Lachi, Life Versace. This has been an amazing conversation. And you guys, please go follow her. Go learn more about Ramp Up. This is a great organization. And be on the lookout for her future book and album that's coming up. And again, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you again, Miss Lachi. And you can catch this episode and more, www.goqueen.com. Make sure you guys be safe, turn those triggers into treasure, and go love yourself. She's a queen about a business, working hard on a mission. Head high, purpose driven, crown.